This week, we'll be talking about the church's primary mission of making disciples with Ken Shigematsu. Ken is the senior pastor of 10th Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's the author of God in My Everything, How an Ancient Rhythm Helps Busy People Enjoy God. He's the author of Survival Guide for the Soul, How I Flourish, How to Flourish and Spiritually in a World that Pressures Us to Achieve. And he's got a new book out that we'll touch on, Now I Become Myself. I'm Charles Galda, president of Vision New England, and your host for the Church in Action program. Ken, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Charles. It's really a pleasure to be with you. Can, can you maybe may give us just a little bit of background for folks who might not know you and, and, and connect your Massachusetts roots, because folks will be wondering why British Columbia... <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, originally from from Japan, uh, but when I was uh, a young boy, we we moved to England, to London, and then to to Vancouver, Canada. My dad was a journalist with the BBC and later with the CBC, the Canadian counterpart to the BBC in Canada. And uh, in my 20s, I worked for the Sony Corporation is what they called a 7-Eleven man, which meant my work week went from seven in the morning till uh, past 11 at night. And uh, I sensed that God was calling me into vocational Christian ministry. So I enrolled at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary there, uh, just north of Boston in South Hamilton. And uh, I've been serving as a pastor of a church in Vancouver, in the heart of the city, since uh, 1996. So maybe may just I'm just interested. So why Gordon Conwell, right? We love Gordon Conwell. We're glad you went to Gordon Conwell. But Japan, London, uh, Vancouver doesn't necessarily land in Gordon Conwell. How did you? Why did you choose Gordon Conwell? Well, I was looking for a school that emphasized some of the classics like uh, Old Testament, New Testament studies, theology, history, ancient languages, and I visited. Uh, a few different seminaries, but when I went to Gordon Conwell, I just had a subjective sense that this was where the spirit was was leading me. And as I look back, I sense that that was part of God's providential guidance. I feel deeply grateful for my connection to New England and to uh, the Boston area and, and Gordon Conwell in particular. Thanks. We're, we're glad you went there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about 10th? Sure. Uh, 10th is a multi-ethnic, multi-site church in the heart of Vancouver. Uh, when I um, first came to 10th back in 1996, the church had cycled through about 20 ministers in 20 years. So there was a lot of turnover. And uh, the secretary walked into my office on one of the first days and said, uh, Ken, if the ship sinks now, uh, the church had gone from over a thousand in its heyday to a hundred and something. And uh, it looked like we might have to close our doors. Um, the secretary said, if the ship sinks now, everyone will blame you because you were the last captain at the helm. <laughs> she was trying to motivate me to, to work hard or harder. That's encouraging. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah, depressed. And at the time, uh, the church was composed of mostly senior citizens of European ancestry and the church has re-emerged as a diverse multi-ethnic community with, with five different sites. That's great, that's great, thanks. And, and so I think you know our focus this year really has been around uh, helping the church make disciples, people who look and act like Jesus, something that we've done some research on and shown we're actually, we believe the church is weak at, specifically mm -hmm. the, and I only focus on New England, I can't speak outside of New England, but we hear similar things. Um, and part of it is we don't even have the a definition sometimes of what a disciple is. We don't have an understanding of the role of the spiritual disciplines in it. So your, your, your book, um, God of My Everything, really speaks into this space. Uh, and you talk about it. I want to start with the subtitle, God in My Everything. Uh, what are you meaning by that phrase? By that phrase, I mean that we can experience God uh, not just in our, our formal times of prayer, but in, in literally every part of our lives. And, and the book was inspired by a pilgrimage that I took to Ireland. I was um, a new pastor, as I mentioned, and feeling a lot of pressure to keep the, the church you know, above, above water, so to speak, uh, to keep it from sinking. Obviously, that was God's work, not, not mine primarily, but I was bearing the burden of some of that. And I felt like I was constantly uh, treading water. And my mentor, Leighton Ford, 
who uh, is the brother-in-law to the late Billy Graham and has a strong connection to Gordon Conwell, invited me to join him on a pilgrimage to the holy places of Ireland. And so we visited some of the ancient monasteries and from the monks learned about a way of life that they describe as a, a rule of life that enabled them to experience God as alive and real, not just when they were formally praying in a chapel, but as they were working out in the field, as they were studying in a library, as they were preparing a meal in a kitchen. And so when I write about God in our everything, I mean that we can experience God in every dimension of our lives, not just when we're engaged in a specific spiritual discipline like prayer, but in our family lives, in our work lives, uh, in our study, even in our play and, and recreation. And and so what what does that but let's let's first talk about so there's there's a sense of what you're saying in the in the subtitle too is that that's a problem for busy people. Is that is that fair? Yeah, yeah, that, that's absolutely fair. Mm -hmm. Why why do busy people have a a bigger problem in this than people? And and by the way, who's not busy? I'd like you to identify those three people for us. <laughs> yeah, when when we're busy. Um, we tend to uh, flip from one thing to another. Maybe we engage in multitasking. And so our attention and capacity to notice things uh, becomes flabby and, 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 and weak. And so if our, our life, our schedule feels overwhelmed, then we will have less capacity to pay attention to the God who is always with us. Uh, Thomas Keating defined prayer as... Um, reducing or eliminating the monumental illusion that God is absent. And so it's as we are able to slow down and simplify our life in, in, in different ways that we have more capacity to pay attention to the God who is always with us. And, and so I'm going to put some words in your mouth, so feel free to take them back out if I get it wrong. <laughs> but, but because part of what I think I hear in that is that um, we would we would say, well, of course, God is always with us. God is never absent. But in practice, he actually we actually ignore him without meaning to or thinking we're doing it or just because we're doing so many stuff. Is, is that am I getting what you're you're, you're meaning? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that uh, most people that are part of this uh, conversation, the viewers, listeners would say, I, I believe that God is always with us, but in our day-to-day -day experience, we can lose consciousness of the fact that God is actually with us closer than our breath. And because and, we're so, and so so what does that look like then? Because there's one part is is that okay, so I've got I've got a lot of things I have to do today. Um, and I have to focus on doing those things, even if I'm not busy to the point of distraction, but I'm, I'm getting stuff done that I think God has called me to do. Now, there's a lot of things I do that I don't think God has called me to do, and I haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, but what, what does that look like then? How do I experience God while I'm doing all this stuff that actually requires thought about that stuff? Yeah, if we carve out some time, whether it's in the morning or in the evening to attend to God's presence, then our, our mind and our, our spirit will be more primed to notice God in the rest of the day. And even if we are doing a task, whether it's accounting or surgery or mopping up a floor somewhere or raising kids, if we have some time at the beginning or end of the day that is set aside to focus on God, will be more primed to do that very activity, even if it feels at some level, not very spiritual or even secular as an offering, an offering to God. Um, practically, we can also um, set reminders in our day to allow us to pause. So sometimes I'll, I don't have it um, set right now, but I may um, set a, a chime on my, on my watch to chime on the hour to, briefly remind me to 
thank God for this day and to pause and to remember his presence. I think of a surgeon in our faith community who before he engages in surgery, takes a moment to briefly pray that God would guide his hands and his mind in that, in that act. So there might be parts of it where it's an intentional stopping to pray. Um, uh, yeah, I know at Gordon Conwell on the Boston campus, at least a bell goes off mm -hmm. at noon and everybody stops right. to pray. Mm -hmm. right? So, there, so that, which is a good practice is, is there, but you, when you're talking about noticing God, is it stopping to pause to communicate to God? Or are you also saying that I'm going to be more aware of God acting in my life if I slow down enough to notice it and stay focused on him? Yeah, it's exactly. Um, sometimes um, noticing God involves a specific intervention, like setting a, a literal bell or chime. But if we create some space to be with God, say in the morning or in the evening, as uh, someone I know has said, uh, when I take 10 or 15 minutes to stretch and meditate in the morning, it's like God shows up more mm -hmm. in the day. Now, we know uh, theologically that that's not completely accurate because God is with uh, this guy named Steve all the time. But if we set aside some time to consciously seek God, we'll be more aware of God's presence in other parts of our day. It's a bit like um, if you're in the market for, say, a new uh, vehicle, uh, maybe you're thinking about getting a Honda Civic or maybe you're thinking electric, maybe, maybe even like a Tesla. Uh, because that vehicle is in your mind, when you go out to wherever it is, Boston, wherever it is in New England, you start to notice more of these vehicles. It seems like there are more of those cars on the road. Uh, that's probably not objectively the case but because you're primed to notice them, it seems like there are more. And when we do things like engage in a prayer practice or soak in scripture, we're primed to notice God more throughout the rest of our day. Mm. You're reminding me of a story. I remember a secretary telling us a story about she's in with our CEO and he's, uh, this was back in my corporate days and he's typing away on his keyboard. He's not looking at her and she's talking. She finally just stops talking because he's got her back to, his back to her. Mm -hmm. And he says, no, keep going. And she said, no, I've been married 30 years. I know when I'm being ignored. <laughs> <laughs> and she stops, right? And, yeah. and so it's the same thing. So God can be back there talking, but we're not, we've shut him out mm -hmm. because of what, what we're doing. But, but isn't, as part of the challenge, I, I don't, I worked in Canada for four years. So, but, but I'm, I, I don't know British Columbia well at all. I, I, was, I was there maybe once or twice. And but to be American is to be busy. And I and I've started to wonder how much we maybe even idolize the notion of being busy because it gives me status. Well, you want me to stop being busy, but right, I, I got too much to do to stop being busy. Is is that is that a Canadian thing too? Is that or is that just us? Yeah, it's also a Canadian thing as well, uh, that um, we feel that our, our value is determined largely by what we do, what we accomplish. And so we tend to be very busy uh, in some cases. Um, we have seasons, of course, like uh, Americans, where we need to be, say, juggling several jobs to make ends meet. But in other cases, it's because we're shoring up something that feels like uh, is lacking inside us. Uh, we feel like we need to validate ourselves through what we accomplish, our performance, what we do. And so the dynamics are similar. And that's by itself is broken right there, right? Mm -hmm. And and so when you say to me then, stop stop being as busy, is that is is that part of your message? I need to be less busy. Yeah, that, that's that's part of it. Yeah, um, I find myself praying the words of the uh, Trappist monk Thomas Merton, uh, Lord, free me from the laziness disguised as activity when activity is not required of me. And so part of the call is to discern what it is that God is calling us to, what is most essential, and to honor those things. And um, and if we do that, then we'll have um, a, a wiser, uh, more life-giving, more God-honoring, more joyful existence. Can, can you say that quote again for folks, please? Oh, the, 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 the Merton quote? Yeah, Lord, free me from the laziness that goes about disguised as activity when activity is not required of me. And then he goes on and says, 
Grant me the humility in which alone is rest. Yeah, there's, uh, you're reminding me of a pastor who asked me in the beginning of COVID, she had paused like everybody else had to, and said, I wonder if ministry is supposed to be this busy. Hmm. And I think we can say just life is supposed, it doesn't have to be ministry, and life is supposed to be this busy. And I, I came across uh, a quote from Dallas Willard last week that because I'm, I'm busy and I'd be right. Uh, I've always been busy and I'd, I'd like being busy. You know? And he said, busy people. And we would always have the quote, which you probably know from the UK, because I got it from my UK friends. Um, you know, if you want to get something done, ask a busy person because mm-hmm. yeah. they know how to get things done. So I mm-hmm. like that I can get things done. And Dallas Willard's point was busy people are lazy. Which made me stop. And he, and he said, because they won't take the time to figure out what is really important and what God is calling them to do. And they let other people then drive what happens in their mm-hmm. life. That's convicting. Is, and would you would you agree with that? Yeah. C.S. Lewis, I think, says something similar that there is a kind of sloth to, to busyness because the person has failed to identify what's most important and, and plan accordingly. And has simply let um, other people's agenda um, dictate their own. So we've gotten all we've, we're getting all this worth and ego. I think I'm fair to say, at least personally, from being busy. Mm-hmm. And now we're hearing that it's an obstacle to God, and it's getting our worth from the wrong place, and we're lazy. Mm-hmm. We've gotten it completely upside down. Mm-hmm. So, so what's, so what's our solution is, is the rule of life? Is that what's trying to get at the solution for us? Yeah, that, that's part of it. So you, you uh, quoted Dallas Willard and he gave a, a simple definition of a rule of life. He wasn't talking about a rule of life per se, but what he said really feeds into this idea. And he said, um, organize your life so that you are experiencing maximum contentment, joy, and confidence in your everyday life with God. And so I feel that's wise and beautiful to organize our lives so that we're experiencing maximum joy, contentment, and and confidence in in, in God. And so a rule of life helps us to structure our lives to to make that possible through um, practices like silence, uh, soaking in scripture, honoring the Sabbath, uh, what, so what is, how do you define a rule of life then? So the, the, the image that I use in, in God in my everything is, is that of a, of a trellis. Uh, a trellis uh, is a structure that supports a grapevine in a vineyard, enabling it to receive more sunlight, to be pruned and guided in its growth so that it produces better grapes and therefore better wine. And a rule of life is simply a way of life that acts like a trellis that supports our, our, our life with God so that we're exposed to more of the sunlight of Jesus, so to speak, so that our lives can be pruned, simplified, guided, so that we bear more of the, the fruit of his character in our existence, in our lives, more of his love, more of his joy, more of his peace. And so do you mind sharing what your rule of life is? Yeah, my rule of life is 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 pretty simple. It it is comprised of, of primarily three things. One is Sabbath, which ideally is a 24-hour period of time where I'm not doing anything uh, directly related to my work. It's also uh, a palace in time, to use Joshua Heschel's expression, where I delight in God, enjoy God's presence, give thanks to God delight in life itself. So that might mean running through a forest trail with our golden retriever, Sasha, or spending some time on the beach and delighting in the most important people in my life, including my wife, my son, family, and, and, and friends. So Sabbath is part of it. Exercise is another part of my simple rule of life. Uh, I prefer to begin the mornings with a, with a swim. And uh, I, I don't mean to impose this on anyone else, but uh, Dr. James a Proshaka, a, a, a professor there in, um, in New England, uh, has pointed out that exercise is a kind of keystone habit which triggers change in other parts of our life. So if we regularly exercise, we tend to make healthier eating choices. We tend to be more focused when we're actually working or studying. The data also show 
that people who regularly exercise tend to be more patient with those around them because they feel less stressed out. And there's another surprise finding that people who regularly exercise use their credit cards less. <laughs> <laughs> the experts don't know why. I think I know why, even though I'm an amateur, it's because when you've exercised, you're just too tired to go shopping. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case or not. So Sabbath, exercise is part of my rhythm. And then meditation. I'm uh, a very easily distracted person at any given time. I can feel like there are 123 monkeys jumping around in my head. And so every morning, as I did this morning, I'll simply take some time to sit and breathe deeply, my, breathing in deeply, exhaling slowly. And then I'll start to wonder how much time has gone by. So I'll reach for my phone, not to check my messages, but to um, open up a free app called Centering Prayer. And I might uh, set the timer to uh, 15 or 20 minutes so that I'm not thinking about the time and I can just continue to breathe in, exhale and when my mind wanders, I might use a simple word or passage from scripture like be still and know that I am God or the word wait from Isaiah 40 just to focus my spirit. And when I'm done, the chime sounds and uh, I'm not sure if you can hear that. I open my eyes and I, I always feel just a little bit more relaxed, a little bit more focused and throughout the day, just a bit more aware of the presence of Jesus. So um, Sabbath, exercise, uh, centering prayer and meditation are, are part of my simple rule of life. So let me come back to this being aware of the presence of Jesus again, because analytical people like me, I think, probably struggle with what that means. And so, so it doesn't mean you feel like Jesus is there with you. Um, or does it mean you're thinking about something to do with Jesus or something else entirely? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It doesn't necessarily always mean that I'm consciously thinking about Jesus per se, but it's more of an awareness that I'm I'm not alone, uh, that that God is is with me, that I'm I'm seen by God, and so it it, it uh, manifests itself within me as a greater peace, a greater confidence, and sense of reassurance. That, that's helpful because now I can equate it to like when my wife is in the room, she might be doing her thing. I'm doing my thing, but I'm yeah, aware she's out. there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, uh, so that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and so how did you develop your rule of life? Did you go through a process? Did somebody help you? How do you develop a rule of life? Yeah, so um, it happened gradually. I um, tend to be a, a workaholic by... By nature, I don't know if that has to do with my Japanese Asian Asian roots, and so I had a sense that I needed to exhibit my trust to demonstrate my trust in God by taking at least one day off uh, off each week because there's always more work uh, that needs to be done than I can do seemingly in in even seven days. So um, I felt that Sabbath was an important act of, of trust in God. It's also one of uh, the Ten Commandments, the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And then um, I also found that I was, as I mentioned earlier, pretty easily uh, distracted, that I could get anxious and uh, harried in my spirit. And um, when I found out about meditative prayer, at first it was very difficult. It felt like uh, the waterfall was <laughs> gushing through my mind. But as I stayed with it, it felt like uh, my mind was becoming more like a river and then eventually like a, a still like a, there, there are still times when I'm distracted in silence and in meditative prayer, but that's something that I felt like I, I, I really needed. And, and so I was looking for practices that would give me a sense of greater connection with God, a greater sense of being alive. And so um, I have experimented in um, Sabbath, as I mentioned, um, meditative prayer and exercise were um, what what have remained? I, exercise has been a, a pretty regular habit throughout my lifetime, so that's not so new. 
and everything, at least in your rule of life, what I'm hearing is some things have to stop to make the space for those things mm -hmm. yeah. that you're, you're doing. And which means we have to make trade-offs, which mm -hmm. may mean less success, less material wealth, what, what have you. It may not, but it may for mm -hmm. some of us. And we need to go back to our Willard C.S. Lewis point about that. We, yeah, that's what the decisions are about what you're mm -hmm. going to do and not do. Yeah, and, exactly. and so um, when you, when you uh, I'd, I'd like to take uh, to shift gears a little bit. So if folks want um, uh, to uh, get, uh, sorry, got in my everything, right? Amazon, you're better, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're a good book dealers, survival guide for the soul. I'd love to read it and have you come back and talk about that. But mm -hmm. since your new book, now I become myself is so new. I'd love you to actually, could you give me the whole title again and then share a little bit about what you're doing in that? Yeah, so um, the, the whole title is Now I Become Myself, How Deep Grace Heals Our Shame and Restores Our True Self. And the reason I wrote this book is because I've observed that it's not just people who have gone through trauma or abuse that can feel shame, but people who are very successful in a worldly sense also feel that they're not enough at times. And Shame, the irony is, according to psychologists, is, is a, um, an emotion or a state of being that um, is such that the less we are aware of it, the more it actually influences us. And the most powerful way to live free of toxic shame is to have a deep experience of, of the love of God. I, I've been encouraged. Uh, I've heard from some of the first uh, readers. Uh, someone uh, reached out to me and said, when I came uh, to the end of the book, uh, I felt as though I had received a warm embrace from a good friend. I felt loved. Mm -hmm. And someone else said, um, I knew in my head that I was loved by God. But as I prayed the uh, prayer exercises at the, at the end of each of the chapters, uh, I felt like I experienced God's love and I was able to claim my name as the beloved. And it's my hope and prayer that through the book, um, people will experience God's love. So they ex live with a greater lightness of being. So they have the energy uh, to really show up for their lives as their truest self. That's fascinating. I'm, I'm very interested in that. Uh, and so thank you so much for writing it. Thank you for writing all three books. Thank you for being with us today. I'm really grateful for you, for your ministry, for the impact your book had on my life, because I'm grappling with these very same issues. So I'm grateful personally. So thanks so much, Ken. Appreciate you being with us. Yeah, you bet, Charles. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. I'd also like to thank our producer, Jess Mangano, and our listeners. This program is created by Vision New England, which seeks to accelerate evangelism by helping the church make disciples, do justice, foster unity, so people want to know Jesus and New England's transformed. You can find more resources and donate at visionnewengland.org. The program is brought to you by our friends at the Luis Palau Association, who are dedicated to proclaiming the good news, uniting the church, and impacting cities worldwide. Join us next.